Don't know what you guys did this week. I uh, took a quick trip to Houston. I had some work I needed to do down in, in Houston. I want to tell you a little bit about this trip to help us understand some things we're going to be covering today in, in our sermon. And this is how the trip worked for me. I got up early in the morning, got in my car, drove on 65 North and 440 out to the airport. Now, at that time of day, even though it was early, I was not the only person on Interstate 65. There were a lot of people driving on Interstate 65, and there were also a lot of them at the airport. Apparently, that's where they were all going, because when I got there, I normally park in the surface lot and kind of walk in. It saves $10 a day, but you know, I don't know when the last time was you were at the airport, but they have these digital signs that tell you how many spaces are available in each lot, and so my, my lot, the one that's for me, only had 11 spaces, and I thought, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to to find a parking space with just 11 spaces. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm not driving 11 cars, I'm driving just one car. So I'm gonna chance it, I'm gonna go in the parking lot and see if I can find a space, and I'm pleased to report I found the space. It was all the way in the last row. I mean, there was a lot of people at the airport. So I hike into the airport, there's all kinds of people going all kinds of different places. Then I got on the plane. Now the plane, mercifully, was not entirely full. But there's still over 100 people on the plane and they're all going to Houston. When I arrived at Houston, I checked the internet. It turns out that in Houston, there's 2.3 million people. But now I'm there. So it's 2.3 million and one, right? That's how many people are in Houston right now. And all these people are doing their thing. I go and I get a rental car and I drive two hours out into the country. I had this little town I needed to visit. I'm spending a little bit of time there. And there's 5,000 people in this little town. But now I'm there, so it's 5,000 and one, right? I mean, they need to change it in Wikipedia or whatever. And I do the things that I need to do, and I, and I drive back to Houston. I actually managed to connect briefly with a friend, and then I took a flight back the next day. Now, that flight wasn't like the first one, because this was a Friday, and I don't know when the last time was you flew to Nashville on a Friday. That plane's never empty. I mean, there were so there are 175 seats and 175 people on the plane. Everybody wants to come to Nashville for the weekend. So I get off the plane. Now I'm in Nashville. There's normally 1.3 million people in Nashville, but now there's 1.3 million in one because I've, you know, I've showed up. And, and then I go back home, and that was, that was kind of my trip. Now, as I'm telling you that story, you probably didn't even notice something about the way I, I told it. And that's this. There's one word I use almost more than any other word, and that word is I. I went to Houston. I got on the interstate. There were other people on the interstate, but this is what I was doing. I got on a plane. The plane went to Houston. Now I'm in Houston. I go to this small town, and I come back. I, 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 I. But I wasn't the only one, right? I mean, there's people on the plane. There's people in, in Houston. And, and coming back, back home, there's, there's people on the plane. And all those people are doing something. But when I tell the story, the story isn't about those people. The story is about me. And if you were asked me, hey, Ken, what were the other 174 people doing on the plane? I would say, not only don't I know, I don't honestly really care all that much. I mean, I'm, whatever their story is, that's, that's not my story. I'm telling you my story because when I'm looking at the world, I look at it through my eyes. I can only see the world from inside my own head. Now, that's not unique to me. All of us do this. All of us do this. We, we all talk about the world from our own perspective. And we talked about in the, that in the first couple weeks of this year. You might remember that I said when, when God created the world, he didn't do it for us. He did it for his own glory. And you might remember I put a globe up here on the stage and I had a hacksaw. And I said, if I cut through the globe... We're not going to find in the middle of it a small-scale model of me because the world, as much as I want it to, doesn't revolve around me. I'm not the center of the universe. And yet, when we speak about the world, when when we talk about it, when we're interacting with each other, we tell it from our own point of view because that's the point of view that we know. Yesterday, a couple of us went downtown and we ran in this big race. If you were trying to go anywhere downtown yesterday, you couldn't do it because there were roads blocked. And a few of us did that. And here's the funny thing. If you were to ask us, we would tell you about the race that we ran. But there were thousands of other people running it at the same time. We're not interested in their story. They all have one. I mean, there's a story about how they trained to get there. There's a story about 
how well they did. Did they meet their goal? Did they not meet their goal? Was it too hot? Was it too cold? They'll all tell you a story. But the story that we're interested in is our own story. We want to make the story of the universe, all of it, about us because that's really the only way that we can experience it. We want to make it about us. I want to make it about me. You want to make it about you. And that's a very human thing to do. And here's what I want to suggest this morning. I think we do that not just when we're telling stories, but when we pray. Because I think so often when we pray, we're praying about our needs. We tell God what it is that we want. We tell him what we're struggling with. We tell him the places where we lack, what, where it is that we want to have success or victory. Anybody that's ever bought a lottery ticket, tell me you haven't prayed when you purchased that thing, right? We pray about our health. We pray about our relationships. We pray about our finances, our jobs, all the things. We give God a list of we want what we want him to do for us. And it's not just when we're praying on our own. If you've ever been in a small group Bible study or a prayer meeting, I think a lot of times we do this, we do the same thing. Uh, where, where you have a, a Sunday school class or a small group, and then you get to the end, and then what is it that we say? Does anybody have any prayer requests, right? And then maybe if it's an especially spiritual group, we, we write them all down. But what are those prayer requests about? I'm struggling, with my, I'm struggling with my wife, not me. I mean, somebody else. We're, we're, having problems, we're having problems in our marriage. We want you to pray about that. Uh, I'm not married. I want you to pray about that. I have an issue with my job or this thing or that thing. And sometimes it's not completely about us, but it might be about someone else. But we're still praying for something that we want. We are a very self-centered and egocentric people even when we pray. And just so we're clear and so that you don't, miss here anything else that I'm going to say this morning. I want to be clear. There's nothing wrong with presenting our request to God. In fact, in Scripture, we are actually commanded and encouraged to do that. God tells us, present your request. Give me, give me your petitions. In fact, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, do you remember what he has them pray? God, give us this day our daily bread. That's a prayer for provision. Make sure that I have enough to eat God, I'm trusting you with that. So it's not wrong to give our, our requests and our wants and our desires to God. That's not wrong. I, I just think that it's incomplete. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to kind of double-click on a topic I introduced a few weeks ago when we were talking about our hearts. And you might remember that uh, we, we talked about how, how heart beats height and how, it's, how what we do with our hearts is important. And I said, in Scripture, Solomon, David's son, tells us to guard our hearts. And I gave all of you a card. Remember this card? Okay. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are like, oh, I don't remember the card. I wasn't here that week. I don't remember. And this is what I said. In Proverbs chapter 4, Solomon says, guard my heart above all, guard your heart above all else, for it's the source of life. And I said, one of the ways that we can pray is to take something that's in Scripture and to turn it around and make it in the first person. So I gave you these cards where I crossed out the word your and I put in the word my. And I said, this is what I want you to do for a week. I want you to carry this card with you and I want you to pray this prayer. God, guard my heart above all else, for it's the source of life. Don't let my mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let my lips talk deviously. Now, I'm not going to call you out because here's the deal. If I say, how many of you did this, it's going to produce one of two emotions. First emotion would be, uh, I did it and I'm proud of it, so now I'm going to be a Pharisee and raise my hand. And the second emotion would be, I didn't do it and I'm kind of ashamed of that, so I don't know if I should lie. I'm feeling like, so there's no, there's no margin and there's no percentage for me in, in asking that. I'm just going to say, this is a great exercise to learn to pray Scripture. And today we're going to expand on that exercise because my goal is to use this time to teach us how to pray better and to help us change our perspective on prayer. And we're going to be talking and teaching through Psalm chapter 23. And Adam, oh, I'm so grateful to have Adam here today, by the way. Thank you for bringing your team. Adam, Adam already introduced this idea. And in our life groups this morning, we've looked 
It's Psalm 23. Here's what I learned in, in, in my life group this morning. What I learned is that there are people in this congregation whose lives have been tremendously impacted, changed. Their directions have turned. Um, God has taught them through this particular psalm. It's one of the most well-loved pieces of Scripture in all the Bible. It's written by David, and even if you don't recognize the name, Psalm 23, if you've been to a funeral, you've probably heard this psalm. If you've seen a movie with a battle scene where they're sending the heroes out into, into terrible danger and, and darkness, you might have heard Psalm 23 read. Even non-Christians know Psalm 23. And as I've been reading this psalm and reflecting on it and thinking about it, what I would share, since it's so familiar, what is there for us to learn this morning? I, I came across two things that, that I think are really interesting to me, and, and here's one of them. There's something in the psalm that I think is missing. If I'd written this psalm, there would have been something included that's not here, and we're going to talk about what I'm not saying that it's wrong, just to be clear, it's a, for point of illustration. The psalm is perfect as it is, uh, but I see that there's, there's a theme there that's not addressed that kind of catches my attention. And then the other is that there's something there that when we read it, we skip it. Because it doesn't quite fit with the rest of the psalm. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to read Psalm 23. Hunter's going to put it up on the screen. And it says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restore, renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Go ahead and have a seat. Now, one of the challenges of preaching in this psalm is not only does everybody know it, uh, it's that everybody memorized it or read it in a different translation. So this morning, if I slip up and slip into either King James or the NIV, just forgive me. But I think almost all of us have heard or known this psalm. Here's what's interesting. David writes this psalm from the perspective of a sheep. And we met David in our narrative just a few weeks ago. What we found is that David, when we first meet him, he is a shepherd. He's just a young man, maybe a boy, and he's out in the fields tending sheep. So David knows a lot about sheep. I don't know a lot about sheep. I've never had a pet sheep. I thought about bringing one here this morning just for fun, but I think it would have been a little bit too distracting. Then we would have had to clean up. But here's what I know about sheep from watching YouTube and reading other people write about sheep. Sheep are utterly dependent on the shepherd. You don't find very many wild sheep. Like nobody ever says, let's go, let's go sheep hunting. Sheep are a domesticated animal. They've been domesticated for thousands of years, and they're dependent on their shepherds for everything. In fact, this week, I've, this is amazing to me. If a sheep has like a lot of wool, and its wool is really heavy, and it falls over on its back, it's like the lady in that old commercial. She's, it's fallen, and it can't get up. It literally needs a person, an external force, to help it stand. You can go on YouTube and watch videos of this happening. Sheep are dependent on the shepherd, they have complete and total trust in the man or the woman that leads them. And in Psalm 23, David, the shepherd, gives us two different images of the Lord. And the first, the first is as a shepherd, and that's verses 1 to 4. And in verses 1 to 4, this is, this is what we find. These are all the things that, that the shepherd does for the sheep or that God does for David. He gives him food. He leads him to the place where the grass is. And this morning in our, in, our, in our life group before church, we actually watched a video. We have this idea of, of sheep being led to pastures that are full of grass. In the place where this psalm is written, that's not the case. It's a shepherd leading a sheep to a place where there is some grass that they have to work and look for, but only the shepherd knows where it is. So he brings the sheep to where the grass is because without the grass, they can't eat. And he also brings them to where the water is, water that's acceptable to a sheep, water that a sheep will drink, a quiet, a quiet water, probably an, an oasis or maybe a small stream without 
much movement. So the sheep is dependent on the shepherd for basic sustenance. And then he makes the, the shepherd makes the sheep lie down and rest. He, he gives the sheep life by taking care of it. He provides direction. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And he provides security. The sheep, when he's with the shepherd, does not fear. Even when he walks through a dark valley, if the shepherd is leading the sheep through a dark valley, the sheep doesn't fear anything because the shepherd leads, guides, comforts, and corrects the sheep. In fact, the shepherd provides discipline for the sheep. And how many of us know that discipline from someone that loves us actually is comforting? That's what we do for our children when they discipline when we discipline them and what our parents did for us, when they raised us in a house where there was discipline. So we find that God as a shepherd provides food, water, rest, life, direction, security, discipline, purpose. That's verses 1 to 4 of Psalm chapter 23. But in verse 5 to 6, the image changes a little bit. Shepherds don't typically invite their sheep to a banquet table, and we see this image of God as a host. And David is a man, or the sheep, if you want to carry that metaphor through. He's invited to a banquet. Now, I don't know about you, when I read in the presence of my enemies, I, I mean, I don't, I don't have any enemies. At least, I don't, I don't think I have any enemies. Maybe I do. Maybe I've had some in the past. So maybe this is just God, God is preparing a provision for me in a place in front of people that uh, maybe I don't like very much, or maybe they don't like me very much. We're not enemies, but, you know, we're not hanging out. And, and God... God invites, invites David to this banquet and anoints his head with oil, makes his cup overflow. Not only is he invited for basic provision to a feast, but there's more there than is needed. And David gets to live in the house of God forever. It's easy to see why this psalm is so popular. I mean, who doesn't want these things? Don't you want to eat at the table of God and live in his house forever? In this life, don't you want rest? Don't you want, don't you want provision? Don't you want direction, security? Don't you want the discipline that God provides for us? I mean, Psalm 23 is just this masterpiece, masterpiece of literature, a prayer of David to God, the perspective of a sheep to the shepherd. And yet, When I read it, I'm struck by this idea that I really think there's something missing. And here's what's missing. David doesn't ask for anything. When I pray, when I pray, mostly what I'm doing is asking God to do stuff for me. Now, to be clear, in some of David's prayers recorded in Scripture, David does ask God and does petition God for things. But in this psalm, he doesn't do that at all. In fact, the very first verse says this, I have what I want. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. The other translation says, I will not be in want. David gives us six verses, a prayer to God, and doesn't ask God. For anything, that's not the way I pray. That's not the way most Christians I know pray. And when I'm in a, when a small group setting and we're all together praying, I'm, it's like a memory test. We're just going down the thing. Everybody has a prayer request, and at the end, you, gotta, you, know, you just have to pay very careful attention because the small group leader might assign you to pray for somebody's request, and you forgot what it was. Anybody ever been there? You're, okay, you're all laughing. You know, that's not just me. Um, I'm the opposite. I mean, I pray for the stuff that distracts me, the things that concern me. I pray about uh, the finances in my home. I pray about my family almost every day. You know, I've been praying for this congregation since, uh, since your last pastor deci- uh, resigned in October. And when I heard that, I started praying for this, past, this, uh, for, uh, for this congregation almost immediately. And, and in, in the interim here where I'm sort of, I'm your interim shepherd, I mean, Jesus is the, is the good shepherd. I'm kind of an under-shepherd and I'm temporary because we got somebody new that's coming. But in this season, I'm your shepherd. I'm concerned for you. I'm praying about the things that I want for you. Here's what that looks like. I think most of us pray looking in a mirror. And regardless of how good looking we are, what we learn is that the center of the universe does not run through our head. 
But this is what we want God to do for us. We have a list that we repeat every day of all the, pra- all the requests, the needs, the wants, the desires that we want God to answer. David sometimes asks God for what he needs, but not in this psalm, and maybe that's a good thing. What would happen if God answered all of our prayers? You know, that's, a, that's the title of the country song. I thank God for unanswered prayers. Some of you are too, are too young to remember it, and I actually had to look up when this movie came out, and it was 21 years ago, which is terrifying to me, but there was a movie, Bruce Almighty. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I'm just not, but there's the premise of the movie is that the, this um, character played by Jim Carrey is given the powers of God. God is played in the movie by Morgan Freeman. And Jim Carrey gets all the powers of God, and then he has to decide what it is that he's going to do with all the prayer requests that people are praying. And so what what Jim Carrey does is just hit literally a button that says yes to all. He grants everybody's prayer requests. And crazy things happen because it turns out that we don't always pray for things that are good for us. In fact, one of the funniest scenes in the movie is that everybody wins the lottery at the same time. So instead of winning 10 or 20 or $30 million, they all get like a buck 25 or whatever it is. And they're all there collecting their lottery winnings, but it, but it doesn't come out the way that they wanted it to. And I think when we pray with what we have in mind, it looks a lot like that. Not David. David didn't do that. David's not worrying at all. He says, I have what I need. In David's meditation, and David's prayer, he's more thankful to God uh, than, than he is prepared to ask God to do stuff for him. It's a meditation and a prayer that shows complete trust the way that a sheep trusts a shepherd because sheep don't worry. As long as they can see the shepherd, they're good. They have complete and total trust in the shepherd. What's missing from Psalm 23? Anything that David wants, we pray kind of the opposite of that. Now, here's the four words that we skip. At least I've skipped this most of my life as I've read this psalm, and we're going we're to put up. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God does things for David, not because of what David wants or needs, but for his own glory. And again, going back to the very first few weeks you and I spent together, the whole story belongs to God. We are just these small, little pieces in a much bigger story than, that, that God is writing. We want the story to be about us. It isn't about us. Okay, I went to Houston, and that was a story kind of about me. But there's 174 people going back and forth on the plane. They're, they had a story that was all about them. And I can tell you about all the things that I did, but the truth is that God is working in those other stories too. All those people had stories. God has one story that he's writing for the entire world, and we're just pieces of it. It's natural, it's human to see it from our point of view, and God does tell us to bring our request in, but that isn't everything that we should pray. In fact, here's the main idea I want you to take away from uh, this message today. I'm going to give you one main idea and then a couple challenges. We're going to work together to make that work. God writes our story for his glory. God writes our story for his glory. When God provides us food, when he answers prayer, when when he gives us direction, when he satisfies our needs, when David says, I have everything that I need, God didn't give that to David because David needed it. David was was a beneficiary of something that God was doing for his own purposes. God writes our story for his needs and for his glory. What we think God does for us, he's really doing for him because he's glorified when our needs are met. That isn't like praying into a mirror. It's praying with binoculars. No, not because it helps us see God, but because it it just, when we pray, we aren't looking at ourselves We're acknowledging that God might be doing something that's bigger than us. So you can pray looking into a mirror as if we are the most important person in the world, or pray looking through binoculars as if there might be a bigger plan than our own interests. I think, I think we can learn to pray 
how David prayed. And I want us to rethink how we approach God in prayer, because here's the thing, there's 150 psalms, and all, or at least most of them, can be used as prayers. And when we pray the psalms, we are praying biblically to the character of God, because God inspired the writing of those psalms. And if you haven't read all the way through the book of Psalms, I mean, there are there's some interesting things in there that don't always fit necessarily into our, our personal theology or what we think God should be like. But this morning, I was so blessed in our, in our, in our uh, life group right before church to hear two men say, Psalm 23 has been a major influence in my life. In fact, I pray it once a day. And in one case, I pray this psalm multiple times times in a day. It's not something that I read. It's something that I pray. And so we're going to put it back up. And here's, here's what I want us to do. Try it as a prayer. God, you're my shepherd. Thank you for giving me what I need. Thank you for making me lie down in green pastures and leading me beside quiet waters. God, I have, I have more than enough food and provisions for my life. In fact, you've renewed my life. You've restored my soul. You guide me along right paths, not for my glory and for my benefit, but for yours. When times are hard, and sometimes times are hard, when I go through a dark valley, other translations, the shadow of the valley of death, I'm not going to fear. I trust you because you're with me. Thank you, God, for being with me, giving me the discipline that actually comforts me and preparing a table before me, inviting me to a banquet, giving me more than I need, letting me dwell in your house for as long as I live. See how it works. We're going to do a couple more. We're going to do a couple more. Here's Psalm 13. This is Psalm 13. I just kind of randomly picked a couple of songs. And, and this, is, this is a little bit different because the context is different. And, and here's David again. How long, God, will you forget me forever? I mean, David is not, he doesn't have, it doesn't sound like he has everything he needs in this psalm. How long, God, will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? Have we had days like this? I think I have. I think you have. How long will my enemy dominate me? David didn't say he had what he needed all the time, but in Psalm 23 and Psalm 13 are a little bit different. Consider me an answer, Lord, my God. Restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I'm going to sleep in death. He's putting it all right back on God. And he says, my enemy will say, I have triumphed over him, and my foes will rejoice because I'm shaken. Now see what David does in the last two verses. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. That's a pretty good prayer. I'm being honest with God about where I'm at, the agony, the anxiety, all those things that I have, and then at the end saying, but you know what? I'm going to trust God because God you, I'm going to trust you. You've dealt with me well. Here's one more. Now, we're not going to do the whole one, and this is why I'm putting this one up here. This is Psalm chapter 41, and what's interesting about this psalm is this is not in the first person. So if you're, if you're praying this, you actually have to change some of the words around it, as I've been doing, and that's kind of okay, because what we read is, happy is one who is considerate of the poor. The Lord will save him in a day of adversity. We can change it. God, I want to be happy. Help me to be considerate of the people that have less than I do so that when I'm in trouble, God, you can save me. The Lord will keep me. God, I want you to keep me. I want you to preserve my life. I want to be blessed in the land, and I don't want my enemies to triumph over me. God, will you sustain me when I'm sick? Will you heal me on the bed where I lie? Now, there's a lot more verses in, in Psalm chapter 41. Those are just the first three. But I think we get the idea. We can take something that's abstract, and instead of reading it, as if it happened to somebody else or it's somebody else's thought, we can make the, make the thought, make the psalm our 
own. And when we do that, we're praying prayers that are bigger than looking in a mirror. We're looking at the bigger plan that God has for us. It helps us pray better. It helps us pray with more purpose. And it reminds us of who we are in the story, which is a character, but not the main character. So here's my challenge for us this week. Uh, if you are in our chronological Bible reading plan, you have one of our big fat Bibles that we sold at the end of last year, or you have one of these bookmarks that are available for free on the back table. We are headed into week 19 of our chronological Bible reading plan. So if you haven't started, you can pick one of these up and start. Uh, and this is, this is my challenge. There are 16 Psalms in our reading this week. So most of them are, are pretty short. And what I want you to do is every day this week, just this week, I'm not asking you to make a commitment for your life, not doing that, but uh, five, six, seven times this week, whether it's weekdays, whatever, between five and seven times, I want you to pick one of these Psalms and I want you to actually pray it. See what that does for your prayer life. Now, this doesn't need to be a long, involved prayer. It could be 30 seconds. It could be a minute. It might be five minutes. You might do more than one psalm. That would be crazy, okay? But I want you, I want us as a congregation to give this a try. The psalms are, are basically a prayer book for us. And yet, when we pray, so often our prayers are all about, God, I want, God, I need, God, please. God, bless me. God, bless my family. God, bless you know, whoever, whatever. Now, everybody understand the assignment? If you're not following along in our chronological Bible reading plan, good news for you. There's another way you can do this. And in fact, you could do this next year after the chronological Bible reading plan is over. I mean, we might do it, that whole thing again. I don't know. But you can actually, I'm just going to teach you a little trick. Somebody taught me this a long time ago. This is crazy. But it's going to be easy to remember. Uh, today is April 27th. So today, if you wanted to pray and you wanted to pray a psalm, you could open your Bible to Psalm chapter 27. Now, tomorrow... We're going to have a new day. That'll be Psalm 28. So tomorrow you could go to Psalm 28. Now, Tuesday you slept in because your alarm didn't go off or you were up too late Monday night, so you don't get to it, and that's just real life. But Wednesday is going to be April 30th. Which one would you go to? Psalm 30. Okay, good. Now, we're, we're going to come up on, on May 1st. And we can, we can start back over at Psalm chapter 1 or watch this. It's like a story problem that they teach you when you're a kid. You can add 30. So you could then go to Psalm 31. And on the second day of the month, you could go to Psalm 32. And then when we get to June, you would add 30 again. Everybody understand. So on June 1st, we would start with Psalm 61. On June 2nd, we would do Psalm 62. Now, you're going to go to Psalm 61, Psalm 91, Psalm 121. We are not going to do Psalm 151. And there's a reason. Because there is no Psalm 151. When you get to 150, you got to start back over at, at, at Psalm 1. But that's five months, 150 different prayers that you can actually use to strengthen the power of your prayer life. Praying well changes us. Do you know, almost every Christian I've ever met, every single one, whenever we talk about prayer, over my entire life says, I don't pray as well as I would like to pray. Almost every one. God gives us a cheat sheet. And when we pray this way, it reminds us that God writes our story for his glory. And I'm gonna, we're going to close in just a minute. So I'm going to ask our, our band to come back up and ask you this question. What if we didn't pray looking in a mirror? As if God was some cosmic Santa Claus or vending machine that if we said the right words, we would get the things that we want. And honestly, a lot of times, isn't that what we do? I mean, we kind of think to ourselves, if, if God and religion and Christianity, if I, mean, if I don't get anything out of it, why bother? What if we didn't pray that way? What if our prayers were less self-centered and more God-centered? What if our prayers were less about us and more about others, less about what we want and more about what God wants? And our prayers went beyond our needs and helped our hearts change so that they match the heart of God. We prayed biblical prayers. What would happen? God writes our story for His glory. Let's make our prayers reflect His glory as our story.